All right. If you would please remain standing for the reading of God's Word before I come to to read, let me just share with you that I'm very blessed this morning that uh, Pastor Tom Joyce is coming to bring God's word to us. I've known uh, Tom since I was probably about 12 years old, and uh, and he was first a uh, retired as a captain in the Navy. Is that correct, Tom? Captain, correct? Yes. And then uh, from there, it said, you know what? I'm just going to retire and take it easy. No. He went on into full-time ministry and has been serving as a pastor at Emmanuel Bible Church in Northern Virginia for the last 21 years. And uh, and so I know that you will be blessed to, to hear from him as we were as men yesterday to hear the word of God. And so, Tom, thank you so much for, for coming. But now hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to be reading a passage that's going to set up uh, a different different passage that Tom will be preaching from this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. I bring you greetings from the East Coast. Uh, We're right outside of Washington, D.C., so uh, I would like to say that the president sent me out here to greet you, but he did not. (laughs) Uh, I also want to echo uh, Dave's uh, thanks to Mike Petro and also his wife, uh, Jane, who provided such uh, warm surroundings yesterday. And, and let me say to the congregation, uh, you are led, shepherded, and encouraged by some really good men. Amen. Some really good men. And so I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I'm also thankful for John and Laura Wojnicki and their family. Uh, we've known them for over 30 years when we were stationed at Naval Air Station Miramar. Uh, I was an F-14 backseater for most of my career, and we met the Wojnickis, and they kind of took our family in and were there for my family as I deployed a number of times, and so I'm very thankful for our relationship. I've known Pastor Dave since he was about uh, this big. Now he's a little bit taller than me. (laughs) Uh, And and by the way, uh, I don't know where he went. Uh, There you are. Okay, Dave. Uh, I just want to, as I said yesterday, I publicly want to thank you for entrusting me to this pulpit. I know the consistency of the teaching of the Word of God here, and may it continue this morning. So thank you for entrusting me. If you have a Bible with you, and I hope that you do, open with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Recently, I received an email from my Naval Academy classmate, who's our class president, and he was asking for volunteers from our class of about a thousand graduates uh, to assist with a number of special events that would take place over the next five years as our class, the class of 1979, would prepare to welcome, mentor, and eventually help celebrate the graduation of the upcoming class of 2029. By way of background, one of the most honored Naval Academy graduation traditions involves a connection with the class that graduated 50 years prior to your class. For me, in the class of 1979, it was the class of 1929. And our class connection with them, a number of members of the class of 1929 served as our mentors, and even some of our instructors as I matriculated through my four years at the Naval Academy, all of them served as our heroes. 
having served our nation in World War II Korea, and even some in the early part of the Vietnam conflict. In preparation for our graduation day, uh, 45 years ago this month, many of them and their families had donated their class rings, their warfare specialty pins, their collar devices, other medals that they had been awarded, all of which were melted down and reformatted into the first collar device that all of us, the graduates, would then wear on our new uniform that we got commissioned on graduation day. I, I wish you could have seen the picture that morning in Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium as one by one our classmates got up to receive our diploma from the Vice President of the United States. And as we walked down the ramp, make our way back to our seats, all of those who could muster from the class of 1929 were there with a long but very orderly reception line, each one of them giving us this strong, hearty handshake, congratulating us, and almost to a man, they said, remember this day. Remember this day. What I didn't know back then, and I see a lot more clearly now, actually remembering that day is what their goal was. Their goal in mentoring and encouraging us over that four-year period at the Naval Academy in Annapolis was not academic prowess, although each one of them was academically astute in themselves. But they were there to encourage, equip, and enable us to serve the nation proudly and historically as they had throughout their career in the military. And furthermore, it was their desire that they would then pass on to us what we would then pass on to the generations that would follow. We know this biblical principle. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says to Timothy, the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men who'll be able to teach others also. And so the tradition continues at the Naval Academy, but even more importantly, the tradition should continue in the church, should it not. And think about from Paul to Timothy, to faithful men, to others, to others, to others, to carry that out, it eventually crossed the Atlantic, and it came to you, and it came to me. And now we bear this tremendous responsibility to continue to pass it on to others. I can't think of a more perfect setting than what the Apostle Paul gives here in Colossians chapter 1, where he gives our mandate. This is what we are now responsible for. Those of us who know Jesus personally, and have been, the gospel has been shared clearly with us, and we have received it, we now bear a tremendous responsibility. Look with me in Colossians 1. Can you imagine these words chiseled in stone that we would pass by every day that we begin this life here on planet Earth, reminded of the responsibility that we have? Look what Paul writes in the last two verses of Colossians chapter 1. Paul says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also, I labor, he says, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. If not chiseled in stone, it should be definitely chiseled in our hearts. Somebody shared the gospel with us, and now we are called to proclaim him. And by the way, in these two verses, we can see this is not a passive thing that we do. Paul gives, and I want to go through them, five specific 
action verbs here in these two verses that I think should embolden us in how we share and with whom we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts here in the very first verse, verse 28. He says, we proclaim, there's the first action verb. We are called to proclaim the truth as the centerpiece of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, in speaking to his disciples, before he transited to the cross, in John chapter 14, told them exactly what he was about to do and then how they could find their way there. We know the story. They was with his disciples, and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. There will I will be, you will be with me also. Thomas, my namesake, the doubting one, the one that probably asked the question that everybody else knew that they wanted the answer to. He said, but Lord, how will we know how to get there? And here's the bullseye of the, my point. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so now Paul reminds us we are to proclaim him. There's no way to come to the Father but by him, and we have to proclaim that. Despite what the world is saying, we're proclaiming him. And we're proclaiming him to those that will listen, and even more boldly and loudly to those that refuse to listen. The penalty is way too serious for them not to understand. The second action verb, we're called to not only proclaim him, but we're called to admonish. And I believe that the admonishing that Paul speaks about here of every man is giving every man warning or, or exhorting every man with intentional, personal, and consistent counsel. For the non-believer, I, I think this admonishing that Paul is speaking about here is that we're pointing out the cause and effect of sin nature and, and that they are in great jeopardy if, not they, if they do not respond to the gospel. And I believe that the admonishing of every believer is comparing the life of the Word of God against the reality of a believer's life and allowing that person to see areas where their faithfulness has fallen short. Or, or perhaps, to put it another way, to help them get back on track, help them to get the bullseye in the center of their sights. We're called to admonish every man. And thirdly, he says, we're called to also teach every man. Paul says we proclaim him so that we can admonish and we can teach. It's amazing with biblical illiteracy today across the country, yet across the world, that people just don't know about Jesus. And we need to know him well enough to be able to tell about what we know. Where he came from, the fact that he existed before the foundation of time why he came, how he lived, what he spoke about, who his friends were, the mission that he accomplished on the cross, the fact that he actually literally died, but that he rose again, hallelujah. And then that he ascended to the Father, and what he's doing now, that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, defending our reputation and speaking our name, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is calling us out before God as phonies. And Jesus said, no, I paid for that one. And the fact that he's coming again, hallelujah, that he's coming again. We need to admonish, but we also need to teach about Jesus Christ boldly, unashamedly. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation, that we would be willing to teach people about what we know to be true. And I would submit that this idea of admonishing and teaching can never be uncoupled, because if all we do is teach and teach and teach and teach, and there's never an admonishment, but probably never a transformation in a person's life. Their heads are full of the facts of the gospel, but it's never transited to the heart where there's actual 
transformation where the Holy Spirit will take up residence. And if all we ever do is admonish people and call them to accountability and we don't teach them, they'll be no different than the Pharisees, as Jesus said. They, they adjust their behavior. They're clean looking on the outside, but inside there's so much turmoil and distress. And so I believe that when the apostle admonish and teach, I believe that he wants us to do these together, gently, but authoritatively and firmly to admonish and teach those about Jesus Christ. The, the fourth action verb we see is to present. Not only does Paul tell us to proclaim him, to admonish and teach every man, but we're also called to present every man complete in Christ. And let me be clear to say that when we say we're supposed to present every man complete in Christ, we're not saying that we have any part, any part in a, making a person positionally complete before Christ. The work of Christ on the cross, the completed work, when he said, Testelestai, it, it is finished, it is completed, that was all that was necessary. Nothing that we bring, nothing that we do or say will ever make it more complete about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But what Paul appears to be saying is that you and I have a responsibility to remind every man and every woman what it means to be positionally complete in Christ. Remind them what it means to be positionally complete in Christ, justified before God, no longer enemies with Jesus, declared righteous, completely and forever forgiven of sin and awaiting a future glory in heaven. I believe that you and I have a responsibility to urge every man, every woman towards Christ-likeness by way of sanctification. Or, or as one author, I love the way one author put it, to help every man, every woman become in practice what they already are in position. To become in practice what we already are in our position with Christ. Finally, the last action verb that he gives us here is the action verb labor. Look what it says in verse 29. Paul says, for this purpose, the purpose is proclaiming, admonishing, teaching, and presenting. For this purpose, he says, I labor. And then he uses this word after that, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. When Paul is speaking about how we labor, in delivering the gospel, he, he attaches this word striving to it. And by the way, the, the word striving in the original Greek is the word agonizomai. You can, you can hear within agonizomai how we get our English word agony. And in other words, the, the Apostle Paul is saying here that I am so committed, and like-minded we should be, I am so committed to making sure that I am proclaiming him admonishing, teaching, presenting. For this, I labor. I am agonizing over it. I mean, this is not a hobby for Paul. This is the center point of his life. This is all of who he is. And we know he gave his life for it. As did the disciples. And we may as well. But the apostle Paul says, I labor over this. And he's calling us to the same labor. For the Apostle Paul, he says at the end of the verse in 29, he says, striving according to his power. He realizes he cannot do it alone. And so he's completely relying on the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to enable, equip, encourage him to be able to proclaim the gospel to present every man in Christ, to admonish, to teach. 
for this I labor. Paul said that he was doing it as if God was not involved, but he was trusting that the power would come from God. The scripture says that we are called to proclaim, admonish, teach, present, and labor. And so concludes my introduction. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, I want to make practical application of this text this morning. Anytime I think we look at the scriptures... We've got to remember, and I spoke to this about this with the men yesterday, we've got to remember that all the Scripture is inspired of God. It sounds like a catchy verse. Well, it happens to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be found to be adequate equipped for every good work. And, and so when you and I share the scriptures with one another, or, or Pastor David is up here, or whoever is sharing the scriptures, we have to remind ourselves that the scriptures are really the word of God to not just the people who have accepted him, but to the entire world. Those that even do not like him and have turned their back against him but they're still responsible to him. And so anytime I make application of the scripture, I always am careful to make application both for the non-believer and for the believer. Why the non-believer, you may say? When Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 1, he says everybody, he's speaking universally of the world, everybody that's ever been created. He's all mankind. He says even the unbeliever, they suppress the truth they know the truth. God has placed a void in their hearts, but they know right from wrong. But they said they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And so as a pastor, as someone who's called to teach and preach, I'm required to fulfill what the Apostle Paul speaks about in Romans 1, that the unbeliever suppresses the truth in their unrighteousness, but they're still responsible to the truth. And I've got to be careful because just as much as we say we present every man complete in Christ and we're presenting the gospel, I've also got to be able to share with the non-believers and said, and if you don't accept the gospel in full disclosure, here's what your life will look like. And so my friends, if you're here this morning, let me be very clear, there's never been a time that you have come to the point in your life where you have accepted Jesus, his finished work on the cross in Calvary 2,000 years ago, if there's never been a time that you put your faith and trust in him and him alone for your salvation, I would put you in the category as an unbeliever. My question is easy for what, what are you waiting for? What are the proof that you need? You may be able to ignore the electric bill in your residence for one, maybe two months. They'll give you grace, but eventually they're going to shut off your electric. You can ignore it for as long as you want, but eventually you have to pay the bill. And friend, if there's never been a time that you put your faith and trust in Christ, the electric bill is coming due. At most, somebody may live 60, 70, 80 maybe even a hundred years here on earth. But we know that really this is just a down payment of what's yet to come. And the decision you make about Jesus Christ here during your time on earth is going to reflect and affect your relationship with him for all of eternity. And you've been presented with the gospel. I've shared it with you this morning. You may have come into the door this morning and said, never heard the gospel. I'm one of those biblical illiterate that you're talking about. But I'm sorry, Then now when you're leaving, you'll never be able to say, I didn't hear it. Nobody ever told me I didn't know. And the Bible is very clear that for those who choose, either out of arrogance or ignorance, to 
turn their back on what Jesus has offered, that they'll spend eternity separated from God with no hope of recovery. Hell's not a place where they review every six months parole to see who will be released. There's never a time where somebody will visit you and bring you good gifts. There's never a time that you'll work your way up to some other platform in hell. It's separation from God, from the people of God, for all of eternity without any hope of recovery. And friend, I won't let you go there without a fight. There's never been a time of salvation for you. My question is, what are you waiting for? We have no idea how long we will or will not live here on earth. On the morning of September 11, 2001, my office was one of the ones that was struck in the Pentagon. The God spared my life. I couldn't help but think right after that about all the people up in New York City, specifically in the World Trade Center, or many of my comrades that were working below me in the Pentagon, I would say that not a single one of them that morning woke up and as the men were fixing their ties in the mirror and the women maybe were finishing up their makeup, not a single one of them looked in the mirror that day and said, well, today's my last day on earth. And yet thousands perished. I can remember walking down the escalators as the fire was raging all around us and the power was knocked out. We were walking down the escalators and in the wreckage, I could hear people yelling, will somebody help me? Will somebody show me the way? Save me. We couldn't get to them. The fire was 1,500 degrees. Most of them were rescued by the first responders that came in through the penetration hole of the airplane in the Pentagon. But here we are 23 years later, and people are still yelling across the globe, will somebody help me? Will somebody show me the way? Will somebody save me? Friends, Jesus saves. And if there's never been a time that you put your faith and trust in him, let today be the day of your salvation. For the believer in Jesus Christ, our calling, our response to this should be very obvious. We're to proclaim him. We're to admonish every man and teach every man so that we can present every man complete in Christ. And there ought to be enough sweat going on in our lives daily that we can honestly say, as the Apostle Paul says, we're laboring for that cause that we are really, really laboring. Do you remember the story of Jesus in teaching in Matthew chapter 14? Uh, they had been a full day of ministry, Jesus preaching and healing. So many had come to see him. It was coming towards the end of the day, and the disciples were concerned. And they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, look at the crowd. Send them into town. Send them somewhere to get food and shelter. In other words, what the disciples were saying was, all these people have come, and don't let their problem now become our problem. That's the disciples' thinking. And Jesus admonished them. And he said, looked at them, and he looked at the crowd. And he said, you feed them. These people have come for help. They've come for answers. They've come for, for healing. And you want to send them away? He said, you feed them. I don't know about you, but I put myself in the place of those disciples because I would be no different. At the end of the day, I'm tired. It's been long. I've been watching Jesus preach and teach, and I don't want to have to take care of all these people, but I feel the finger pointing right at me, and Jesus says, Joyce, you feed them. This is our responsibility. And you know what? It is our responsibility. Paul merely repeats what Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 14, and we're called to feed them. And we think maybe people aren't coming with throngs and they're not showing physical ailments, but we know people who are broken. They're emotionally, spiritually broken. Their marriages and lives are a mess. They're out of work. They've got physical maladies. They're coming to us, 
and we want to turn them away? We got to feed them. We got to feed them. Had an opportunity. Uh, this was about 30 years ago. In fact, it was 30 years ago this year. I was on my last flying assignment, and I was a commanding officer uh, of an F-14 squadron. And I remember we were out in the middle of the Persian Gulf for a long time, 145 straight days. And I remember it was uh, about 120 uh, out on the flight deck, and we were in the middle of a sandstorm. You say 120. Um, that's like Tuesday in Valley Center. Uh, but I remember a, a guy in the squadron coming in and just in frustration because he was so sweaty and so full of dust and we had been at sea for, you know, months and he came in and screamed, does anybody understand what in the world is so important about the Middle East that we're here in this? I mean, he used some other languages that I won't share. And I don't know why, but my mouth opened and the words came out. I think I know why we're here. And he looked at me and said, okay, you're on. I want you to prepare a briefing for the entire squadron. And you got 15 minutes on Thursday to give it. Okay. I have been reading a lot about the end times and about all the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and I thought this is perfect, but I only have 15 minutes. So I put a PowerPoint slides together. I had some music to go with the slides. Thursday came, we had the meeting, run for all this administrative stuff, and then the guy turns around and says, Joyce, you're on. So I came up and started the PowerPoint with the, with the slides, and my 15-minute presentation about why the importance of the Middle East and why it's so strategically important and biblically important, my 15-minute presentation lasted two and a half hours. I mean, I threw terms at them like the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Their minds, talking about the rapture, went, just blew their minds. They had so many questions. In fact, the guy that would blew up in the ready room and and asked me to do the presentation, had most of the questions. I had another Christian brother in the squadron, and he was in the back, and he raised his hand. He said, you just said the rapture that only those that are saved get to leave and go. What does it mean to be saved? How was someone? He was a total plant. It was excellent. <laughs> Two and a half hours. I'm just hitting the ball back over the net with each one of these guys. 98% of them had never heard anything like that, had no connection to the gospel, had no connection to Christ. We're called to feed them. You want to send them away? Feed them. I wound up giving that presentation to eight other squadrons on that carrier. All nine squadrons in the air wing got that presentation. Each one of them lasted about two to two and a half hours. Everybody walked around just talking. All they wanted to talk about was the rapture. Because they were hoping to get out of there. I said, man, we, I hope this rapture occurs so we can go home wherever they thought they were going. But was, just as a funny side note, the next day on the flight schedule, I was flying two events, one in the morning and one in the night. And it had an asterisk next to my name. This is on official military document. Asterisk next to my name with another guy's name with a little thing in parents that said, if the rapture occurs, you got to replace Joyce on the flight schedule. <laughs> we proclaim him. Admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we can present, Paul says, every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to the power which mightily works 
within me. Remember this day. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the completeness of your word here by the Apostle Paul. It is indeed a, a call out for each of us, a reminder. The gospel came to us, and we don't just hide that in a corner selfishly. But as you told your disciples, um, feed them. And that's our calling as well. God, I think if there's any, any in the room today or who are listening, that you would um, tender their hearts towards the gospel if they've not done so already. As I often pray, Lord, would you give them no rest, keep them up all night, have their thinking be cloudy until they are focused, focused on giving their life to you. And then those of us, Lord, who, who know you, and we have this unique responsibility now to pass on. Somebody brought it to us, and now we have a responsibility to share with others. And Lord, would you embolden us? And of course, through the power of the Holy Spirit, equip us. We would be grateful for that in our service to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.